Hi there. I'm Scott, and this is Great Scott Knitting, a podcast, vlog, thingy. Um, welcome to episode 12. If you're a returning viewer, viewer, thanks for tuning in. Hi, Sadie. Oh, hi, Sadie. That's my dog, Sadie. Um, if you're a returning viewer, thanks for uh, tuning in, checking it out uh, one more time. Um, and if you are new to this podcast, welcome, and I hope you enjoy uh, what you see on this channel and in this episode. Today is December 6th of 2020. It's almost over. This year, that is. And um, here in Wichita, Kansas, it was a beautiful 52 degrees and sunny. Um, I actually almost thought about uh, doing this podcast outside, but um, smarter thoughts came along and I said, no, I'm going to stay inside. Um, so anyway, everybody, welcome. Uh, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're watching. Um, my uh, office has been rearranged because um, my, my nephew who has recently moved in with us um well his um significant other has also moved in with us and um we needed some extra space in their bedroom so there were actually two beds in that room and so one of those beds is now in my office so now i have an office bed which is actually also as you can see uh doubling as a dog bed for my dog Sadie and my other dog Gunner who is a Scottish Terrier and then of course uh, over here on the floor which you can't see is my um, other dog Pepper so you might see them floating around um, from now on as I do these podcasts because of the new environment that I find myself in in terms of the space in my office. So you have a, diff a little bit of a different angle. You get to see some different uh, wall art, uh, still Star Wars, but hey, it's a different view. Um, yeah, so it's one of the kind of crazy things that's happened over the past three weeks. Uh, we've had Thanksgiving, we've had the start of December, we've had all sorts of crazy things um, going on. Um, in terms of the politics of the United States and um, things going on online. I, anyway, it's just been crazy. So if you um, if you've been missing me, that's what's been going on. There's been just craziness going on at my house and you know with with Thanksgiving and with uh, getting ready for the holidays. And, Time just has slipped away, and but hey, here I am. Here we are with episode twelve. It's the holidays, so hey, let's get into the knitting. And I have been very busy getting ready for the holidays with my knitting. Um, but to start off with, um, a non-holiday knit that I have been working on has been my scrunchable scarf. So if you have been watching of late, you know that. <clears throat> I have been working on this scarf for some time. It is a scarf that um, really it's, it's inspired more by the yarn. I was playing around with um, mixing colors using food coloring for yarn dyeing. And so I mixed up like a red, an orange, a yellow, a green, a blue, and a violet. And I dyed some uh, recycled yarn, which is an 80 percent wool 20% nylon blend which was recycled from a sweater I bought at the thrift store and so I finally got this done it's a decent length so each of the color sections are about 20 grams of yarn so about 100 grams of I'm gonna call it fingering weight yarn fingering to sport weight so um it's a nice little scarf kind of fun um little color block thing going on um the pattern is really quite simple but is called the scrunchable scarf by susan mccone 
It's just a basic ribbing pattern, as you can see. Um, I think it's just a one row pattern that just repeats um, on both sides. So it's very simple, easy, uh, no nonsense um, type of knit that um, makes a really nice little scarf. Um, so yeah, I'll probably donate this for uh, the holidays for someone to make use of. Um, yeah, so that finally got off the needles, which was just in time because I needed those needles to finish up some other projects. Um, okay, so the first of the holiday knitting that I got done was a shawl called Easy Goes It. The Easy Goes It pattern is by Finicky Creations. And it is just a really lovely little shawl. Um, really more of a scarf, but um, this was a really fun and simple knit. It's mostly garter stitch, some eyelet panels, and then within that garter stitch, there's some you know, just stocking it and rid and uh, garter ridge things going on. Really easy, asymmetrical shawl. If you've never done lace, this would be a great starting project to, to learn some basic lace pattern concepts. Um, it's just a really pretty... Eh, see if I can actually put it on. It's a really pretty shawl. I can't. It looks like crap. Oh, well. Um, really pretty, really simple, easy knit, um, knits up really quickly, actually. Uh, so the yarn is, um, Dyer Supplier 7525, uh, Merino Nylon Fingering Yarn. So just a basic sock, the basic sock yarn from Dyer Supplier. I hand dyed it using, uh, food coloring and, um, homemade sugar sprinkles to make the, uh, just those those green speckles on it. And the green speckles were actually meant to be black speckles, but the black broke, as black food coloring likes to do. Um, so it broke into some lovely green colors. So it's just really nice. And the yellow, and it kind of picks up a little bit, is not solid, but it's more variegated because it was dyed using lots of different types of yellow food coloring in lots of different colors and tones. So um, it's it has this really great uh, variegated yellow look as well as having that the green speckles over the top of it. Um, so it's really pretty. I really like how that turned out. And of course, with the merino, it's just so soft. So nice. The second item, excuse me, my nose itched. Um, the second item off the needles for the holidays was the pattern called Confetti by uh, Jennifer Tipton. Another really fun, quick, easy pattern. Um, again, it, it actually, what's, what's very, very surprising or interesting is that it looks dramatically or a lot like Easy Goes It. Um, so very, very similar pattern. Am I showing it the right side? Yes. A very similar pattern um, of uh, alternating garter stitch, some stockinette patterns, and then some eyelet bands. Um, which then ends in that repeated eyelet band going on within the stock in it or within the garter stitch. Um, very easy knit, very fun, very simple, but it just looks so pretty. Um, again, uh, this is back to that um, Dyer Supplier 7525 Merino Nylon Fingering Yarn in this variegated yellow base that I had created. The same kind of base color that I did for uh, the Easy Goes It, only no speckles this time. Um, so really quite lovely. 
Oh, oh, the other, oh, I almost forgot. The cool thing about this particular pattern is its bind off. Instead of a standard bind off, it has a bobble bind off. So it has these little bobbles that you, you that you bind off on the edge, which gives it kind of a nice little, uh, a different kind of finish to it, as opposed to just, you know, abrupt, abruptly ending and binding off. It, there's just that little flare at the end, which is kind of fun. So um, I like, I like it when the end of it is interesting and fun. Um, one more shawl off the needles is the shawl that I've had on the needles for a while. It's been a work in progress for a while. So you've probably seen parts of this if you go back a little bit and it's that spring thaw. So let me show you that pattern real quick. That's the spring thaw pattern is by Sherry McEwen. It's a, um, all of these patterns so far are free patterns on Ravelry. Um, I've knit this one before. It's uh, really, um, for a lace pattern, it's relatively easy to memorize. And um, it has just this really, the, the end of it, the, the lace end of it is really pretty. It looks complicated but it really isn't. It's, it's a, it looks so lovely and so delicate and it's really quite simple. Um, so, excuse me, a great pattern for an early lace knitter to accomplish. It looks amazing, um, but it's really quite, um, quite an easy pattern to follow and finish. Um, there are actually two possible endings to this shawl and I did the the uh, more complicated ending or the intermediate ending um, which is a little bit different so there's some options for how you finish this shawl off uh, but I highly recommend it as an option for um, an early uh, a beginning lace knitter now it's a triangular shawl basically but it's actually more wing like in that it's not straight across like this but it's more angular like that, but just so much fun, so pretty. And I just love how, how it ends. So it's really quite nice. Um, the, this yarn is um, Cascade Heritage 150, which is technically a fingering weight yarn, but it's actually um, it's a little bit heavier, at least in my estimation, than standard fingering weight. It's almost a sport weight, um, in my opinion, but, um, yeah, re really quite lovely. It's a 7525, uh, Superwash Merino, uh, nylon blend. Um, nice yarn to work with. I mean, it's fine. Um, I actually like the dyer supplier a little bit better that I dyed myself, but, uh, yeah, I love how this how this turned out. Um, I've enjoyed knitting this pattern before, and um, and that was using acrylic yarn. So this using this with actual um, a, a wool yarn was a delight, and the the lace opened up really beautifully. I'm really pleased with how that turned out. So though you know this has been a yellow explosion <laughs> i'm so i i love the color yellow do not get me wrong knitting with these during these cold wintry um late fall months and weeks has really been has helped brighten the day mo quite literally um because the color is so bright and so cheerful um it has been kind of nice to have those as my projects that are on the needles. And, um, but I'm really quite tired of knitting with yellow. I want to go on to a different color um, really quite soon. And actually I have um, one other thing that I did complete and I don't remember what the pattern was. I think it's the cobbled cowl. 
Um, it's a pattern that I've uh, that I've done recently, but um, I just finished this cowl um, in a yarn that I or in a colorway that I dyed. This is a 100% um, wool. I think it's um, oh, I can't remember what what the wool is, but it's just a basic wool. It's a it's a relatively short cowl, but um, well, nice enough. Um, I love the colorway because it, I, I, okay, when I say that, even though I dyed it myself, I have to say that the reason I say it is I love how it knit up. Look at all those different colors that have come through on this yarn. There's, of course, this foresty green. There's some purples. There's some light blues. Um, there are some dark blues. I mean, it's just an interesting color. And I love the stitch pattern because it really kind of blends them together really nicely. Um, so I love how this turned out. I One thing I wish that I had done was not stopped at it being so short. I should have continued on and made it longer or you know wider as a as a cowl so it would bunch up a bit more but really love it it's really pretty and i always especially when i'm working with woolly really really woolly wool which this is um a really really woolly wool um i like to soak it in fabric softener and you probably shouldn't but it makes it a lot softer to the touch and it, of course it smells wonderful okay um with that um those are the last knitting projects that i have finished over the last i guess it's three weeks um i only have one dyeing project that i've completed but i have not edited or uploaded any videos on this but i'll share share with you <clears throat> the finished product and then you I'll eventually get the process of dyeing these two skeins um, published so you can watch those. Um, make sure that you subscribe to my channel, click on the little bell icon so you know when I upload new content and you'll be able to uh, enjoy that video. Okay, so two skeins of yarn that I did, um, again with this lovely dyer supplier sock yarn 75 percent superwash merino 25 percent nylon fingering weight yarn love it um i i'd have to say this is probably my favorite base to work with currently um that and i have to say i do like the the nitpicks dk but i digress um okay so I'll start with this one because this is the most interesting one that I did. This skein of yarn, which, uh, does it pick up very well? Eh. It's not bad. Um, okay, so this skein of yarn is very, looks very, very, very speckled. And it looks like I did a lot of fun speckling over a sort of a beige-ish, orange-ish, pinkish base. It's a very pastel base uh, looking yarn with lots of speckles. So to reveal a little bit about how I did that is it's a sock blank or or a really a yarn blank because it's not it wasn't knit up as a sock. I um, created my own yarn blank on my um i have a uh, knitting little hand crank knitting machine and i stenciled it with a handmade paper stencil of various leaves uh, various leaf types so there's like some maple leaves and oak leaves and uh different types of uh, you know, and elm elm tree leaves and all that kind of thing um, that I then sprayed. I used these little um, these little spray bottles and sprayed food coloring, watered down food coloring, 
onto the sock blank and then speckled in like blacks and greens around those leaves that were in orange and red and yellow. Um, set that die. And as you can see on um, right there, that's where I, I unwound it onto the nitty naughty so I could see it. And you can see just how speckled it became. It was just, it just, it looks so great. Um, I'm calling this, I don't know if I'll ever repeat this or not, if I'll ever try and do this again, but I'm calling this my autumn confetti is the, the colorway that I'm calling this. Um, oh my God, this was super fun to do. I am definitely going to be doing things like this in the future um, because it's just so much fun. The preparation takes a lot of time because it takes time to um, make the sock blank. But uh, the results, oh my God, the, so pretty. I can't wait to knit something with that. Um, I, I, yeah, I just loved how that turned out. Absolutely beautiful. The second skein of yarn I did was really with the leftover dye from uh, my my uh, sock blank and my stenciling. And so it's just basically using those reds, those oranges, those yellows in sort of a space dyeing uh, space dyeing thing. Yeah, I can't make you make it to where it's really visible. There we go. And then I speckled over the top of it with greens and browns and blacks. So there's some uh, speckly areas, as you can sort of see throughout this yarn. So um, again, using food coloring um, and my speckles were, again, homemade sugar sprinkles. One of these days, I am going to make the leap into commercial dyes. A um, couple of things have to happen about that. With that, number one, um, I need to get the PPE for it, which means that I have to have some. Um, I have to have some some free cash flow to allow me to go do that, which right now I don't have. But eventually this is going to happen. Pro uh, probably in the first quarter of 2021, I'll be able to make start making that leap because um, I also need to get some other equipment like dye pots, dye pans, some uh, dedicated tongs, some other um, types of things for uh to be my dedicated dye equipment if I'm going to use commercial grade dye, acid dyes. Uh, don't want to mix those with my food coloring uh, tools because those I can, I still use for food. Don't need to mix those two things up. Um, so those are all my finished objects over the past three weeks. Again, with the yarn, I do hope um, within this next week, to get those videos edited and get that dyeing process uh, up on the channel. So works in progress. Um, not a lot going on there because I've been doing so much holiday knitting in yellow. Um, I still have my sock and yes, it is still a singular sock. It is stuck on the uh, leg so why it's not done it's because i don't want to knit socks right now i have been in the midst of holiday shawls um with i think all of my holiday shawl knitting done i can go back to focusing on the sock a little bit um the other thing that i have on my oh and hang on before i move on the sock is an, a really great um, pattern slash recipe for a sock called that's uh, from Sockmatician's Toe Ups by Nathan Taylor. Um, Sockmatician also has a YouTube channel. You should go check him out. Um, 
is a really, really delightful gentleman from London who is also a math geek and brings a lot of math into his dye, his uh, knitting process. So um, check out that pattern, check out his channel. Um, it's worth it. Um, so the other thing I have on my needles is a cowl that I guess you would say I'm designing it. I don't know. I have, I, have, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see if, if you look at this and you're like, Oh, I like that. I would like to knit that up. Let me know. And I'll see if I can write it up and put it out there. This is a hand dyed skein of, um, knit picks, swish worsted, that I dyed up. This is 100% um, superwash merino in worsted weight. This is a skein of yarn that I dyed in the middle of the summer. It was called my, I think I was calling it my uh, fruit basket or something like that because it was, oh, fruit salad. That's what I called it because it was inspired by the summer fruits that I was just enamored with over the summer, the strawberries and blueberries and peaches and all of that that um, inspired this colorway of sort of peachy oranges, some pink and red for strawberries, and of course blues and violets for uh, blueberries. It looks really, it, it turned out really, really well. Okay, so here is the cowl that I have been working on. It's, whoops, dropping a stitch here and I don't want to do that. Um, it's a really easy pattern. It's just a um, checkerboard pattern or basket weave type of pattern with um, stockinette, reverse stockinette, and then um, seed stitch. Um, are the just the, the three types of stitches that are going on. Um, really, uh, really quite easy. It's a 14 stitch um, repeat. So um, I think I cast on 112 stitches and have just knit, started knitting the pattern from the beginning of seven, seven knits, seven purls all the way around. The next for 10 rows, the next one is um, seven stitches of the seed stitch and then seven stitches of stockinette and, and for the next 10 rounds and so on. It just repeats that way. Um, it, it It's really actually quite a, quite a nice, intricate, interesting looking pattern, which I think shows off the colorway really nicely because... With this colorway, the, there's no one color that, that continues for more than like three or four stitches and until it changes to a different color. And sometimes it might be blue for just one stitch and then it goes back to red or an orange um, or some kind of really beige-ish pink. Um, so it, it's really quite nice in that there's no one stitch or, or, or no section that pools a lot. Um, it really works nicely in the um, seed stitch areas. The seed stitch areas are just really kind of are enhanced by the fact that each stitch is a different, seems to be a different color, which is really quite nice. Um, so I think for this yarn, this pattern works really nicely because you get to see how the color plays out across different types of stitches and um, it just makes for a really, really lovely, um, I think to, in my mind, a really lovely cowl. So I'm looking forward to finishing this up. If you are interested, if you like what you see here, if you would like to be able to replicate this in some fashion, let me know and I will write it up as a pattern and publish it. Um, it may take me a couple of weeks, but um, it's really, really quite simple. Um, but I really like it. I think it's pretty. 
And so that's my work in project in progress. Let me know what you think uh, in the comments. Um, acquisitions and acquisitions continue to be rel relatively slow, but in the last three weeks, I did get my knit crate. Um, actually, it was a sock crate um, that came in. And so I have this lovely skein of um, Audine Wool's alpaca sock, which is a lovely base, an absolutely amazing base. It's a 60% superwash merino, 20% alpaca, 20% nylon. It is really super soft and has a nice sort of halo to it because there's that alpaca that's in it. Um, the color is, the colorway is called Napoli, but it's these um, sort of sea greenish, almost teal um, to sort of a grayish green, um, different tonalities of it. Really pretty. Um, so yeah, it's a really uh, nice uh, skein of yarn. So there's that that I have acquired. And um, yeah, that's a fingering weight yarn. Uh, so who knows what it'll turn into. I don't know if I'm a sock knitter yet. I haven't been able to finish my second or my, my third sock. I still have my original socks. I actually had just, just laundered them not too long ago. They still look quite nice. My first pair of socks that I ever knit, ever. So I'm still working on the second set, the second pair of socks. Maybe before the end of the year, they'll be done. Um, okay, so what am I casting on? Well, I don't know. I'm not real sure. I have been thinking of knitting some cables of late. I haven't knit cables for probably a year since I last knit any cable work. And so um, I've been looking at a couple of potential options. Um, one is this um, Celtic cabled scarf, um, which looks re really quite nice. It's got that, that basic sort of Celtic knot uh, cable pattern to it. Um, this pattern has a suggestion in it of starting with um, basic two by two ribbing for about two inches before you get into the cable, which actually looks really quite nice. Um, so I'm considering doing that. Um, but I saw another pattern as I was looking up cable patterns that had a fringe, but the fringe was not just single strands of yarn. It was what appeared to be two by two um, uh, I cord. Could be interesting to add that onto here. And so to add um, a couple, like an inch or like a two inch I cord um, on the end. Have to think about how to how to make that happen. Anyway, it's just a thought. Who knows? I may or may not do that. Um, but that's the Celtic scarf by um, Colette Audrey. I think. No. Um, Rosie Hernandez. I think. That's. Mm, I don't remember. Um, I didn't write that down. That's odd. Okay, so there's that one. Or the other one, which is the uh, Saxon double braided scarf, actually looks very similar. Um, and that one is by Nicole Wilson. Um, both of these are free patterns on Ravelry. I tend to go for the free patterns because I'm kind of a tight one that way. But occasionally I do, I become so enamored with either a designer or a pattern that I absolutely have to have it and I do pay for them. Um, 
but I do like the free patterns. I often off, uh, offer my patterns for free. I have tried, um, my last pattern I did try out charging for it. I'll probably turn that off in the next year. I don't know. It hasn't really done well, so I don't know. And eh, we'll see. But anyway, um, between these two patterns, I'm I think I'm leading towards this one um, of the two. Um, so no, I'll have to I'll have to make a decision here soon. I'm thinking of using. Oops. Get that turned off. I'm thinking of using the uh, Netology um, Netology Worsted that I picked up earlier this year from Knit Crate. Um, this is a 100% Superwash Merino wool. It's a worsted weight yarn in a colorway called Concrete Jungle. It was a colorway that was curated by um, Brooklyn Boy Knits. A really, really pretty, pretty colorway. So I'm, oop, my, my light died on me. It does that. It overheats. Don't know why. Um, so we'll just have to go with this. Um, so yeah, so one of those two patterns in that yarn, um, yeah, so you'll have to come check that out and see if which one I choose. So what else has been going on? Um, of course, holiday, you know, Thanksgiving prep preparations. Um, my husband loves to do the table, which was absolutely gorgeous this year. Um, we pod with our neighbor who is... Um, she's a diabetic and um, a recent widow, so we basically have taken her under our wing. But we all, so we pod with her so that we can help her with her diabetes. She often crashes, and so we have to go make sure that. Now, some of the things we do is we make sure she eats um, a good meal every day. Um, we help monitor her sugar and make sure that she doesn't crash, which um, she's been a diabetic most all of her life. And so um, with the stresses of life and the stresses of COVID, um, her blood sugar has been all over the place. So we pod with her. And so she spent Thanksgiving with us. And um, unfortunately, because of the craziness that's going on, she wasn't able to go spend it with her family. So there were five of us, um, myself, my husband, um, my nephew and his girlfriend who all live under this roof and then our neighbor lady. Um, so there were five of us. So it was, um, a very nice Thanksgiving. Um, I do all the cooking. So, which kind of, uh, the Thanksgiving meal sort of stresses me out a little bit because there's so much expectation of, that meal because it's tied to to so many memories and um and traditions and tastes and smells and one I, I don't know if you've ever had been the one to create the a Thanksgiving meal or maybe even a Christmas meal that you there, there's a level of weight that, number one, you want that meal to be good. And turkeys are not an easy meal to prepare. Let's just put that out there. Turkeys are not simple. Um, they can easily become dry and flavorless. So that is a huge danger, or at least in my book. So... To me, there's just a lot of pressure on those holiday meals because, number one, you want the meal itself, or I want that meal itself to taste good. And I want it to ha be balanced. I want there to be good meats, some nice, uh, you know, a good selection of vegetables, a good selection of um, starches like potatoes and stuffing. And, and I want all those things to taste good and yet also sort of have a something that sort of they're also sort of unified in their palate 
that's how my mind goes, at least, for that meal. The other... Um, the other weight that I feel when I prepare those types of meals is the importance of evoking memory. Um, so I, I want to evoke memories of other Thanksgivings that were joyful or happy. And, and so there's, there's that. I want to draw out people's memories. And on top of all that, as if that wasn't always already enough, um, to create good memories from that meal, from that day of the food that was prepared. That, because a lot of our memories are tied up and, and become long-term memories because they are tied to emotion. They are tied to smell and taste and color. And so all those things get wrapped up in this meal that I prepare. And so I love, I love to cook. I, that is one of the things I really enjoy doing um, is, is cooking. So I'm the one that pretty much in this household that I do the cooking in the house. Um, but that's one of the, that's one of the things when, when I have a big meal to prepare, those are the things that are in my mind as I'm preparing. And so it is, a little stressful because I feel the weight of those things when I do that preparation. So I can be a little testy on those days. That being said, the turkey was perfectly moist and very flavorful. Um, the rolls were perfect. The Everything was very, very good. Um, so... Um, the meal was very good. The table was gorgeous. My husband sets an amazingly beautiful table when uh, we have these big holidays. He sets a very beautiful table, even at, even on Shabbat. Every Shabbat is it, he sets a really beautiful table um, for the meals that I prepare. So I, I appreciate that a lot because it makes the meal very special. Even though Shabbat is our weekly celebration. Um, we do, we have started, especially in COVID, um, we have really stepped up our Shabbat quite a bit. Um, it, it's become a very big deal. It's, uh, I, I put a little more effort into the meal itself. And um, my husband puts an effort into making the table look beautiful. Between those things, uh, it's just, uh, makes it very special. So there's that. Um, there's the holiday decor, which has, which has gone up. Um, I convinced my spouse that because of the craziness of the year, he was starting to complain a little bit about the fact that a lot of people had started putting their Christmas decorations out before Thanksgiving, which for him is like, that's a no, no, you do not decorate before the holiday, like dramatically before the holiday, even a week before is a little too much for him. So for him, Christmas decorations going up before Thanksgiving, he he hates to see that. Even though we're not Christians and we, we don't celebrate Christmas, that's a bug. He, that bugs him. But I reminded him, hey, in 2020, we need uh, all need a little bit of joy. So you know what? A lot of people are are ready to feel joyful and this brings them joy. So why not? And he's like, okay, then I'm putting up my Hanukkah decorations. And I was like, Sounds like a plan. Let's get them out there. Because Hanukkah's early-ish this year. It's actually this next week. So um, our Hanukkah decorations went up uh, right after Thanksgiving. Um, they were not up at Thanksgiving, so they came up right after Thanksgiving. They look really quite lovely. Um, I will get you... do. I'll probably have some, some shots of that on Instagram... Um, but I'm, I'm, okay, so, yeah, so this actually leads me into sort of my next thought. So, on YouTube, this is something I did not, had never heard of and did not know anything about. Um, of course, this, I just started doing YouTube 
casts, blogs, podcasts, whatever you want to call them. I guess they're called blogs. Let me just put that out there. It's it's actually a blog because it's not a podcast. It's not audio only. It is video. So therefore, it is a video log. So a blog. Um, so there is this event that occurs in December, which I was not aware of. Um, no, one's, no one put this in my mailbox of saying, hey, get ready for this. So I guess there's an event called Vlogmas which is YouTubers are encouraged to post daily videos between December 1st and December 24th to go through these holidays. Now, it is called Vlogmas. It is it ends on Christmas Eve. But a descript one of the one of the people that I have been watching described it as you know it is um, non religious non sectarian anybody can participate, um, but to me I'm like um you call it Vlogmas which sounds like Christmas, it ends technically at least everywhere I've seen it ends on Christmas Eve, so therefore it's pretty much all about Christmas. Technically. Now, in operation, yes, doesn't matter. No, nobody really, it's not so much Christmassy as it is holiday. And there are a lot of holidays going on at this time of year. Um, I know this because I don't celebrate Christmas. I celebrate Hanukkah. Um, and had I known this was going to occur, I might have considered making an attempt at it, but I didn't, so I'm not. However, and the next four days will, well, actually three days, will, um, I'll have to ponder this over the next three days. I am considering posting a video every day of Hanukkah. Um, so if I do, you'll see it. If I don't, you won't. So you'll know. So there we go. So that, that that's something to, to look forward to, or, or not, as it were. What else is going on? Um, movies and TV that I'm watching. Um, I'm still watching, um, The Worst Witch on Netflix. Um, still, uh, it, it, it's delightful. It's a delightful little story. The main character, which used to be this person, has changed to somebody else, which was kind of interesting. Um, uh, they didn't even come out and say, you know, the role of, of you know, the witch will now be played by. It was just like, oh, here's a new, a new actress, and here's the reason her face changed, and boom, we just move on. It was interesting. Um, but I, it's still delightful. It's a it's a nice little storyline. I have also been watching, um, of course, The Mandalorian on Disney Plus. Um, I'm finally getting caught up, and um, no spoilers, but the child has become kind of a little shitty little child. In you know, it's still a very adorable way, but you know basically there, there are a couple scenes I wanted to pop his butt, but you know, that's just how I parent. Um, I've been watching a show on Netflix called Raising Dion. Um, Dion is um, this child here. He is, of course, th this isn't really kind of brought out in the story, but it's basically he's reaching the age of puberty and he's discovering that he has telekinetic powers as well as a few others. Um, his mother, who is a um, widowed single mother, um, is dealing with a child who is beginning to discover that he has powers and how does she deal with that and how she, how does she, she um, raise a, number one, a black child 
and one that also has uh, extraordinary powers. You know, how does she navigate all these things as well as just navigating her own life? Um, it's very interesting, lots of drama. Um, so I'm enjoying that show. I, I do recommend it. it it's, it's a fun sci-fi-ish, superhero-ish kind of show. Um, but without it being super, superhero-ish, if that makes any sense. Um, The Crown. I love this show. I really do. I'm a, I'm a big Anglophile. I always have been. I love the concept of the monarchy. I love Queen Elizabeth. Um, even though, you know, during the, the 80s and early 90s, she kind of pissed me off a little bit in the way she behaved. But um, overall, I, I love... Uh, I love the Queen in real life, and I love this show, The Crown, even though it's fictionalized. There are aspects that are true in the broad concept, broad umbrella concept, uh, the individual happenings behind the scenes, of course, are all fictionalized, but it's fascinating. Um, it's a lovely show, lovely costumes, uh, love the locations the, and the location shots. So I enjoy this show. I highly recommend the show. If you're not watching The Crown, get Netflix. Go catch up on all the past seasons. Um, it's really quite... Uh, it's really a lot of fun to watch. And it's very, very interesting. And um, a lot of it is recent history. So you, if you're... You've probably lived some of this. So that's the fun part, too. Okay. Confession time. I play Pokemon Go. And I completely blame my nephew. Um, a couple of years ago, he spent a couple of weeks with us over the summer. And he was playing Pokemon Go. And, you know, he kept... We would be going places and he'd be like, Oh, can we stop over here? There's a... Poke stop, or there's a gym, or there's something that he wanted to do with Pokemon Go. And we, of course, would oblige, but not having any concept of what, why, or what, wherefore. So I was like, you know what? I want to, I, I kind of wanted to connect with him on one level for something. So I downloaded Pokemon Go on my phone. I started playing on my own. Didn't even tell him, but just started playing it. And I became somewhat hooked. Not obsessed. Not yarn obsessed. But hooked. It was kind of fun. It's kind of a nice little pastime thing. If you're riding in the car and you have nothing better to do, you know, when you, you're going through town and you hit a stop sign and, like, there's a pokey stop, you can grab a couple pokey balls. Um, you know, or capture a couple pokies as you go along or uh, evolve them. And it, it you know, mindless fun. But you know what? I I enjoy it. It's fun. And actually, he, his, uh, my nephew, my, his girlfriend play. I have a couple of other friends in other parts of the country that play that we do things on it together. So, um, and it's kind of interesting also the, the pokey stops are often landmarks or points of interest that you may not have considered as being a point of interest in your local neighborhood or in your town. And it's a way to sort of get to know a little bit of things that are going, you know, some of the interesting things that are in your town. Now, now sometimes the points of interest are a Starbucks, but sometimes they're also a statue or a um, mural that you may not have noticed was there. And so it, it does draw attention to those things. So um, I play Pokemon Go off and on. Right now it's on. Um, it will probably go off again. But right now I'm into Pokemon Go. A little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. All right, so it's class time. Now, normally I talk about fiber and 
yarn and things like that during class time. Um, I reached a point in that study and in the book that I've been reading about that where I'm like, I'm in a section where I'm like, who cares? I wanted to move on to something a bit more interesting. And right now, it, the section that came that would I would normally be talking about now was uh, is more about uh, spinning mills and the fact that a lot of a lot of yarn from different companies are all spun from the same yarn at the same mill at the same time. And so what makes it different? Which is nice, but it doesn't help me understand yarn. Now, the next section is more about um, the plies of yarn. Uh, there's also a little section on coloring, how, how yarn is colored, which of course is very interesting to me. I'm very interested in knowing more about plies single ply, two ply, three ply, four ply, and so on. And the, you know, the effect that that has and why you would use one versus another. But that's for another time. I'm putting all of that on hold until the new year. So we'll get back to talking about yarn in 2021. So until then, I will talk about other things that I'm interested in. And today and this week, it's Hanukkah o Hanukkah, or however you might spell that. Um, yeah, it's spelled a hundred different ways. And so that's what I'm interested in today. So. Um, Hanukkah, it's not Jewish Christmas, just so you know. Uh, Hanukkah is the celebration of the rededication of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, um, sometimes called the Festival of Lights or Chag... Um, hang on. I can't remember right now. Chag Ubim, I believe, um, or the Festival of Lights celebration of lights. Uh, it is a celebration uh, that is observed for eight nights and eight days, starting on the 25th day of Kislev. Kislev is a month in the Jewish calendar of which we are in right now. It's usually uh, Kislev occurs anywhere from the end of uh, end of November all the way up to the beginning um, of January. So it's in that period of time, uh, right now it's in that November, December month, uh, time frame in terms of the Gregorian calendar. And as you know, uh, we observe it by lighting a Hanukkah, which is a nine branched menorah. Uh, technically it's an eight branches with a Shamesh candle as an extra candle. So We'll talk about that a little more deeply here in a second. So why rededicate the temple? Why is this holiday about rededicating the temple? Well, um, back in uh, 175 BCE or before the Common Era, um, the land of Judea, where the, Israel, the Jewish people lived, was part of the Seleucid Empire, or the Greek empire. Um, the, that empire used to be uh, led by Antiochus III, who let the Jewish people basically do what the Jewish people do. They allowed, he allowed them to uh, worship at their temple with sacrifices. He allowed them to read Torah. He didn't have problems with them doing the Jew Jewish things that we do. Along comes Antiochus IV, who came to power and decided that he wanted to Hellenize or um, force the Jewish people to accept Greek culture and beliefs. Um, this did not sit well with a faction of Jewish people who did not want to become more like the Greeks. 
And so a band of Jews led by Judah the Maccabee or Judah the Hammer um, rose up and um, conducted a guerrilla war against the Greek army and eventually drove them out of Jerusalem and they were able to reclaim the temple um, for the Jewish people. Now, while the Greeks and Antiochus IV um, were occupying Jerusalem and had control of the temple, they defiled the temple by building a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. They sacrificed pigs on the holy altar um, and did other things that would that made the Jewish temple um, unclean for for what we would call, say non kosher for use, not fit for use for our worship and for the things that we would do in the temple, which would you know were our sacrifices and and reading Torah. So when Judah, when Judah Maccabee and the Maccabites um, reclaimed Jerusalem and reclaimed the temple, they cleaned out they cleaned the temple. And um, when they were done cleaning the temple and making it, pre uh, preparing it, they decided to hold an eight-day celebration to rededicate the temple to the worship of God. So Hanukkah is, an eight -day, is the eight-day celebration that we observe in remembrance of this rededication of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Now, that's the sort of a, the historic reason behind this holiday. Now, keep in mind that Hanukkah is technically a minor holiday in the Jewish religion because it is not a holiday that God instituted in Torah. Um, it is not a. It, it, it's not part of Torah. It is. A, what is called a rabbinic holiday. The rabbis of the day instituted this holiday in remembrance of this occurrence. Um, so why is it called the Festival of Lights also? Well, the legend... Well, okay, so when the Jews went to light the temple, this is the legend. When the Jews went to light the temple menorah, which is a seven-branch menorah, um, they only found one cruise or one container of kosher olive oil, which is used to light the menorah. So one cruise would be enough for one night and one day for that menorah to be lit. So the legend is that that one cruise of oil lasted for eight nights and eight days, so and which was enough time to produce more kosher oil and enough then to be able to use it every day. So the Festival of Lights is to commemorate and publicize this miracle to the world that God made one cruise of oil last eight nights and eight days. So that's the legend of Hanukkah. So that is why it's called the Festival of Lights. So it is an eight day or eight night holiday. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the Jewish day starts the night before at sundown. So there you go. Eight nights of Hanukkah. Um, so... Earlier in the year, we have a holiday called Sukkot, which is also an eight-day holiday or an eight-night holiday, technically eight days, um, where in, in Sukkot is the celebration that commemorates the Jewish people leaving Egypt and wandering the desert for 40 years and living in makeshift huts that were easily transportable. So... Um, 
during this holiday, we of Sukkot, we would normally build a hut in our backyard um, and eat and even usually eat the evening meal in that hut usually when there's nice weather. If it's inclement, then we don't, but that's what it's there for. And that's what Sukkot is, which is an eight May holiday. Well, when the Maccabees, when the Maccabees were fighting the Greeks, um, they would have, during that, that holiday season of Sukkot, which is usually around October, um, the thought is they were still fighting the Greeks or if they weren't fighting the Greeks, they were still preparing the temple to be used. Either way, they weren't able to celebrate Sukkot. And so Hanukkah, in a sense, becomes a became a replacement for them. The reason they chose to make it an eight-night holiday was so they could, in a sense, have a, a, a replacement Sukkot. For that year, but then it be, it sort of took on a life of its own, became an eight night Hanukkah celebration. So what do we do? The key thing about this celebration, about this night, is the lighting of the Hanukkah. This is how Jewish people observe Hanukkah. So each night of Hanukkah, we light the candles on this Hanukkah, which is an eight branched menorah with a shamesh or shamesh is, is technically means helper and the shamesh is a helper candle so you light the shamesh on the first night and then use that candle to light the first candle um so then on the second night you light two candles the the, the new candle that you have added and another candle which stood for the first night and so on through the eight nights till the last night you have eight candles plus a shamash that you light the candles do have to burn all the way out they have to burn i believe for at least 30 minutes um so you know even if you had a very small hanukkah you want those you know it needs, still needs to be able to burn for 30 minutes to actually have performed what we call the mitzvah, the commandment, to light the lights of Hanukkah. So we light the lights. We say some. We say uh, some blessings and some prayers. We sing a few songs. Um, though that is the this is the requirement of Hanukkah is the lighting of the Hanukkah. But there are other things we do by custom. So some of the other customs are we eat fried foods like latkes. I love latkes. I love cooking latkes. What are latkes? It's kind of a potato pancake hash brownie thing with onion in it um, that we serve with sour cream and applesauce. Lovely stuff. Um, very, very tasty. Um, we eat um, sufganiyot which are or sufgania which are jelly donuts jelly filled donuts um love me some jelly filled donuts too uh, so fried foods is is the key thing of of this season um some people also do um dairy but i'm i'm more about the fried foods um we play a game called dreidel so if you've ever heard the song um which is probably the most popular Hanukkah songs in the world of dreidel, 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 I made you out of clay, and so on. Um, so we play dreidel. Dreidel is basically a gambling game played with a four-sided top. Now, the four-sided top have um, four Hebrew letters on them. Nun, Gimel, He, Shin, if you are outside of Israel. It's Nun Gimel He Pe if you are inside of Israel. So those letters actually stand for a phrase in Hebrew called Neskadol Hayasham if you're outside of Israel, which means a great miracle happened there. And if you're in Israel, it's Neskadol Hayapo, which means a great miracle happened here. 
Anyway, you play this game. Um, each letter means something different in the playing of the game where you have a pot of coins um, or oftentimes we'll just play for um, chocolate. Um, but that's what that game is, uh, uh, the game of dreidel. Um, there's also a tradition of giving money to children and encouraging the children to use that money for charity or tzedakah. Uh, tzedakah is a uh, Hebrew term for uh, the giving of charity um, for the benefit of others. So we give money to children so that then they can ha feel the joy of giving tzedakah. Um, that has also translated in modern days of having what is called Hanukkah gelt. Gelt is a Yiddish term for coins or money. Um, so chocolate coins are also an aspect of the season. Um, so you'll see if you go to a Hanukkah celebration, not this year, next year, um, you'll see that. Or if you participate in it, maybe a, uh, a virtual Hanukkah celebration this year. So that is are some of the customs of Hanukkah. So what is all what does this really mean for us? So Hanukkah, that term, and that's how it's spelled, Chet Nun Vav Chaf He Hanukkah. Um, that word means dedication. Hanukkah is a time that Jewish people use to rededicate themselves to their faith, to their family, uh, to their community, to passions that they have, as well as to themselves. So I encourage you to, even if you're not Jewish, um, that in this season between um, December 10th and the eight days following December 10th, to think about how you can dedicate yourself or rededicate yourself to your faith, your family, your community, your passions, and yourself. Because um, that's what Hanukkah is about. So that brings us to the end of this episode of Great Scott Knitting. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I love Hanukkah. It's a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I may, I'll, I'll try and do, if, if I don't uh, put something up every day, I'll try and put up at least a couple of videos throughout Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah starts um, the night of uh, December 10th, which is Thursday night. Um, in my household, we, um, the first night, we always have um, latkes, which are uh, a potato pancake. Um, we have, I usually grill some chicken. Um, sometimes we have matzo ball soup. Um, I'm having troubles getting matzo ball soup this year, so I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, we light the first light on the Hanukkah and um, open presents. It's it, now th th there is this f this false concept that every night of Hanukkah you get presents. Most families I know do not do that. Um, they usually choose a night, oftentimes either the first night or the last night of Hanukkah, the, the two to exchange gifts. And then the other nights, they do different things. Like um, the second night, we might play board games because the second night of Hanukkah happens to be Shabbat. So we'll probably do something as a family, you know, either play board games or watch a movie or maybe go out and see holiday lights, you know, pile into the car and drive around and, and, and look at the lights um, that people put out during the holidays. Um, another night, sometimes in past years and probably again in future years but maybe not so much this year 
um, a lot of families on one of the nights of Hanukkah will volunteer and give their time to a charity um, organization, uh, like go working at a food bank or working at a soup kitchen to uh, help other people that are less fortunate than them. Um, so just every night is, is a little bit something different than, you know, a craft night, a uh, movies, board games, you know, things like that. Things that you do as a family and as a community together. Um, and that is something that in this year, I think has become very important. Finding ways that because we are, in a sense, stuck together, to make that stuck togetherness enjoyable uh, and, and a time to, to reflect on and remember and you know, make it a time that when you look back on this, that it, it's not all, oh my God, 2020, Ugh, what a horrible year, that you can also look back on 2020 of, hey, wow, remember when we did this because we were together as a family or we were together as a chosen family as friends um so you know is consider this holiday time where we are together in odd circumstances to make it special to do something extraordinary extra ordinary Um, you can catch me on social media. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook page called Great Scott Knitting. Check it out. Um, I'm on Instagram as Great Scott Knitting. I'll be posting some video or some um, photos out there of uh, Hanukkah decorations and things that are going on. Um, I'm on Ravelry as Great Scott KCMO. Check me out. Go check out some of my patterns that I've written. Um, also, on Ravelry, I, uh, at the request of someone who watched and commented, um, I have created a Ravelry group as something for this podcast. So go check that out. It is Great Scott Knitting, a podcast vlog thingy. So that's out there as well. So thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And um, you know what? Always enjoy the craft that you that you do and um, stay well, my friends.